and then I start talking. Why well, is I talking before I'm talking now? But you know. <laughs> All right, we're joined this hour by Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez, who is uh, an incredible, incredible uh, writer, poet, um, originally from Uruguay, and he's been uh, here in the uh, States in uh, the Rio Grande Valley for the last uh, last few years, and he's going to tell us uh, his amazing journey getting here and his, his story getting here and, and writing. And, and uh, he recently most posted his most recent book uh, with Flower Song Books uh, this January, um, as he tells us more about that. Um, so uh, let's just get started, Gabriel. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how did you, when, when did you start writing poetry? When did you start like, uh, when did you start writing and when did you start taking it real seriously? Okay, so yeah, uh, first of all, it's great to be here, Matt. So thanks for, for the interview um, and the chance to talk about this. So I, you know, I've been reading poetry my whole life, uh, both in Spanish and English, but mostly in Spanish. And, um, and so I like it. I think like everybody who writes poetry, very excited by it but I did and I would write little poems even as a teenager and but and when I was in college I started doing it but I thought oh this is awful you know I'm just not a poet I, this isn't my thing you know I'll when I become a writer I'll be a novelist or whatever um and uh then I moved to the real and I continue writing poetry sort of I call it for the drawer you know for my drawer for no one else to see uh on and off throughout my life. But then when I moved to the Rio Grande Valley, um, every year in April, in fact, it just finished now, uh, the last weekend in April, they have this um, Rio Grande Valley International Poetry Festival. And it's it's a very exciting thing they do. They've been doing it for 13 years. And so a few years ago, when maybe four or five years ago, I, I saw the call and I was like, you know, I'm not really a poet, but I had written a, a sonnet about Brownsville uh brownsville texas and so i thought i'll send it in just to test the waters see how this goes and uh and they they accepted it for publication in boundless which is their the anthology um and that's when i started meeting uh some of the local poets uh like daniel garcia Ordaz and Eduardo Vidaure, and and so it sort of started getting into writing more and more poetry and in the last Maybe five years um, is when I did the bulk of the writing, uh, and and I was really sort of encouraged, especially by Daniel Garcia Ordaz, to to keep doing this. And he put together a little writing group in South Padre Island, and I went there a few times. And so, I, you know, nobody does this in a vacuum. We're all encouraged by others and so forth. And that's how I came to actually there sort of say I dare publish my poetry yeah so uh for our audience watching now um you know it's gonna be viewed by a wide cross-section of people so um they might be as familiar with some of the things you're talking about so can you tell us a little bit about the Rio Grande Poetry Festival can you expand upon that a little bit um what is it like how you know you, you mentioned how long it's been going but like who are some of the key players and what's some of the history behind it right yes um so about my understanding is that 13 years ago, and I say it that way because I wasn't here 13 years ago, but um, Daniel Garcia Ordaz was invited to read some of his poetry at um, what was then the University of Texas Pan American. And uh, and so they had a, like, what they called a, a poetry pachanga together and he invited some friends and uh, there was kind of a big crowd that showed up and they were surprised about this. And so, um, him and Brenda and Errol Riojas, they said, you know, it seems like the Valley is ready for a poetry festival. And so I think a year after that, um, they launched their first international, um, Rio Grande Valley International Poetry Festival. Uh, and that um, it's been going on for now 13 years, I think. I think this was year 13, they always do it in the last week um, in, in April. And it takes place in the McAllen, Edinburgh, so Rio Grande Valley, sort of south, very much south Texas on the border. Um, and it brings in poets, not just local poets, but also poets from Mexico and from other places in Texas. And uh, you'll get people coming in occasionally even from other countries. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. It's four days um, where people do workshops, they do readings at schools, um, there's poetry readings, there's uh, open mic and poetry slams and things. Um, so it's exciting. And I think for those of us that love poetry and that live here, um, it really is a choice thing to be able to take place in. 
Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned there's an international. Oh, there's a little bit of echo. I need to just. Uh, so you mentioned there's kind of an international um, uh, background. Uh, there's an international participation in the, in the, the festival. Um, can you speak a little bit to what brought you to the Rio Grande Valley? Sorry, it, it broke up there at the end. What was the question? What brought you to the Rio Grande Valley? Okay, so um, the reason I, I ended up here was work. Uh, like many people, you sort of follow the, the work needs. And um, I'm a professor at the at what is now the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And you know, I had just finished doing you know my, my doctoral work. And I was living in Europe at the time and had to find a job. So I interviewed with this university and they hired me to train translators and interpreters in Spanish English. That's my background, it's in translation. Um, and so me and my family moved here and we were very excited to discover this place, the, the valley, this, this, the, the borderlands, um, because it's such a rich mixture of American and Mexican culture. And, and it's very, it's a very vigorous, uh, very rich culture. We, we enjoy a lot of sort of these cultural manifestations that take place here. So I always, when I tell people about this in other countries, they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, picture this. Picture that on October 31st, you do Halloween. And then on November 2nd, you do Dia de los Muertos. So when you go to Walmart, you have both the little Dracula and witches, um, but you also have the Katrina dolls and the skulls and the altars. And it's all right there sitting in Walmart and people participate in both. And to me, that's exciting. Um, so, so uh, t uh, tell us um, tell us more about uh, the publication of your first book. Like how, how um, you know, um, before we get into like you know the the details of it, like what what uh, what, what what were you feeling when when, uh, when you saw your first hard copy of the book? That's a very you know that moment when you when you get the book in your hands. That's that's exciting. Um, Edward he sent me a text message and he said, uh, you know, can you come over and. You know, I went the next day uh, to to his place of work, and you know he showed me the book. And of course, when you hold it in your hands and you thumb through it, that's that's uh, very exciting. It's it's sort of that moment of saying, "Oh wow, I can't believe this! I've actually done this." Uh, and so that was that was a lot of fun. So. Uh, for those watching, I gotta keep switching the mute the mute button because it's uh it's got an echo. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about Edward and Flower Song Books? Yes. So, um, if you're not familiar with this press, um, then you should be because it's it's very exciting, and it really is um, a labor of love for him. Uh, he, you may have interviewed. I know you know him well, uh, and and you may have interviewed him here in. Um, but um, he's he's had this experience where you know he was born in El Salvador, then he lived he was raised in California. Now he's uh, uh, in the valley, uh, and he loves poetry, and he's really quite a good poet. And he had early on, Flowerson Press um, or Flowerson Books existed a long time ago. It was a small press, and then he took it over uh, a few years back, and he has. I'm sure he shared it with you, but he has this amazing vision where he will make, in fact, they changed the name from Flower Song Books to Flower Song Press. Um, and it was originally a poetry um, for him. He was publishing poetry, but now that it's a press, he's also publishing children's books and other things. Um, and it is really about giving a voice to Latino, Hispanic, um, minority voices, if you will, uh, through poetry and through their literature that otherwise they wouldn't have. Um, so it's sort of, it, it's becoming in my eyes, sort of the press for, um, for up and coming and for even established Latino writers um, in the USA. And if you look at some of the names that they've published, that they will publish, um, this press is definitely going places. And it's multi generational. I mean, we're talking about like you know some of the really classic, the classic classic writers are getting a lot of the reprints. Um, you know, it's got people like yourself, people like me. Um, you know, I know Chris Munoz is going to do a reading later. Uh, it's got uh, David Romero is coming on board. Um, there's a number of people who are you know Iristianda. 
Um, there's a number, number of like, uh, you know, established writers who are like, you know, in their 30s, 40s, who are, you know, kind of on the move. And it also has people who have these long legacies, but we're all, there are also uh, calls for, uh, you know, youth anthologies. So can you talk a little about the multi-generational nature of what, what Flower Song is doing right now? Yes. So that's one of the things. Th that's why I say this really is a press with a vision. That's Edward's vision, um, where one of the things that he started doing that wasn't happening before is the youth anthologies, right? So he's called on the youth uh, to write their poetry, to tell their story, to help them tell their now, um, as, as he would say. And, uh, and he's published them, so he's given them a venue that they wouldn't otherwise have. And one of the things he's done with the press is he's launching, or is about to launch, um, a, an imprint for youth writers, right? But at the same time, he's also going out there and seeking these established Chicano writers um, to reprint their books and whatnot with him. Um, so it really is, like you said, multi-generation and a cross-section of voices um, of mostly the the Hispanic, Latino, Chicano experience in the U.S., but it's broader than that too. Um, like he has, he published uh, Andrea Boca Sanderson, who is right now the poet laureate of San Antonio, and her stuff is very musical. And it's it's if you haven't heard her, you need to hear her. Um, and of course, your readers know that they need to hear you, your followers. Uh, but uh, but to hear, not just to read her, but to hear her, because there's a performance that goes along with her poetry. So it really is um, attempting to catch all these voices from different places and different uh, minority views, if you will, and put them out there. One of the things he's done is published you. So can we see a copy of that beautiful book? Yes. So here it is. Whoop, uh, let me see. OK, there you go. Uh, so this is the book. It's called Ese Golpe de Luz. Um, and it's it's fully in Spanish, which I think is worth noting uh, because, the, to be honest, I didn't think of doing a bilingual edition when I sent him the manuscript. It, this, then I saw that he's published some bilingual editions, and I thought maybe I could have done that, but I just it didn't cross my mind when I sent him the manuscript. Um, but I think it's sort of a daring thing um, for Flowers on Press to publish bilingual editions and also books that are in Spanish only because it speaks to the really the multilingual, multi-ethnic, if you will, experience of the USA that often goes unseen um, from sort of the from the majority point of view. Can you share with Spawn? Yes. Um, so let me look for a poem. Uh, So I think it, it might be appropriate uh, that I read the, the, the Brownsville poem that I mentioned that was sort of my incursion into the world of poetry because it was included in the, in the Boundless Anthology about five years ago. Um, and I read it at the launch of the anthology. Uh, I, think, I think I'll read that one. It's a sonnet and it's, it's about uh, Brownsville, but it's, it's also about this idea of the bilingualism, biculturalism um, that we get to enjoy here. Uh, and, and to me, it's about how that's really the future. This bilingualism, biculturalism is really the future of, um, of Brownsville, but also it's a metaphor for the future of the United States. Um, so, so let me go ahead and read it. Brownsville. Esto es ciudad y también es frontera. Acá es que se hacen una las culturas. Los inviernos son una primavera, los veranos dejan hondas fisuras. No se sabe qué lengua es la primera, son dos las cuales se usan sin censuras. En las dos se llama a la compañera, en las dos se expresan palabras duras. De tarde se ve a dos niñas jugar y liberar sus imaginaciones de mar, selva y superficie lunar. La promesa muda de este lugar de encuentros, luchas y contradicciones está ahí. In Ishathos, in Susonia. So that's the point. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, that, that, I understand 70% of that. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny. My, my broken Spanish, I, I understand a lot more than I, than I speak, but like, you, there's, there's gaps in my understanding. So oftentimes, I'm, I, I actually end up confused as to what somebody said <laughs> and completely changes the meaning. And I'm like, <laughs> 
but uh, that was no, that that was really beautiful. Can you can you speak a little bit to um uh what you um what what you teach here? Because you mentioned also that you're a professor. So what is it that you that you that you're teaching here at the in in the over there in the uh, the Rio Grande Valley? Right. Yes. So uh, what I do is I train translators and interpreters that work in the English Spanish uh, pair. So. Um, with those languages, both at the undergraduate level, so these are students who are either majoring or minoring in Spanish translation, but also at the graduate level. Um, our graduate program is 100% online, so that means that we have students from all over the U.S. who want to become translators and interpreters. Uh, and so we offer them basically classes that cover a general broad introductions to translation, but also very specific things like court interpreting, legal translation, business translation, literary translation, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, um, so, so what, what, when, when you, you know, when you were in Uruguay growing up, who were some of your literary heroes out there? I mean, like, you know, my mind, the only thing I really, really aware of is uh, Eduardo Galeano. So that's like the great Uruguayan writer that the people across the world are aware of, or the American, anyways. Um, but who are some of the who are some of like your kind of literary heroes um, back then? Right. So um, interestingly, growing up, I was talking to my kids about this yesterday. Um, I wasn't much of a reader as a little kid. I, I that was really my teenage years when I started. Um, reading and really enjoying reading. So I came into reading later than I think a lot of people. Um, and so I I started and and mostly to be honest, I was reading like science fiction and this sort of thing. So I grew up reading a lot of Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury and um, but then I as I especially in my later teenage years and then in college is when I discovered poetry and started reading it. So in terms of poetry, um, Pablo Neruda, of course, is a big one. Uh, and then uh, Mario Benedetti, that's another one that I read a lot of. And then you got these like classical Spanish poems, uh, like Gustavo poets, like Gustavo de Fubeque. Um, and so that that's sort of that was sort of like my my poetry diet. And then I made it a point to like read specific poets that I thought that were important in sort of my own linguistic tradition uh, and cultural tradition. So I go out and look for their book, like Juana de Ibaruru, and read her um, because, you know, she was someone that was big and important. Um, and so, yeah, and what I find is that I can't write poetry if I'm not reading it. Um, for some reason, as, as soon as I start reading poetry, then the poetry sort of starts coming. Um, so I just finished uh, uh, She Lives in Music which is the book by um, Sanderson, by Andrea Volker Sanderson, just last night, in fact. Uh, and before that, I'd read a local author, um, Partituras de Insomnio, on a bilingual edition. Um, and, and so Ramiro Ramirez is his name. So anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of, I think you need to have, if you're writing poetry, to me at least, you need to have a steady dose of Poetry reading. So tell our audience who might be unfamiliar. Oh, uh, there go. So tell our audience who might be unfamiliar about uh, uh, Juana de Ira Barbu. Juana de Barbu, yes. Um, so she, I'm, uh, this might be kind of tacky, but I didn't plan on this. But this doll here uh, is her. Uh, but anyway, I don't know if you can see it. But yeah. Uh, um, in fact, I in, in my home country of Uruguay, I've published some children's books. Uh, and one of these is a biography of her. So I really I admire her work. So she was a, a poet from the early 20th century in Uruguay. Um, her name was put forth a couple of times um, as sort of a pre-candidate for the Nobel um, for the Nobel Prize in Literature, but she never she never got it. Um, but anyway, so she wrote uh, a lot of um sort of i guess the term would be modernist uh literature um i'm not sure what you would call it but it has a lot of it has a lot of rhyme and it builds on the old traditions in terms of meter and rhythm um and if you read and she published her poetry all through her life so if you read her poetry it starts 
sort of very vivacious and and fiery and um, when she's in her earlier years and in her older years it's sort of very dark and somber and there's uh, some hints there of really depression and other things and um, so it's interesting too because I read a lot of her books to see that progression. Yeah. Uh, so w w did you get that doll in uh, Uruguay or did you get it here? Where does that doll come from? <laughs> well, to be honest, I had that doll made. Uh, and we had it made, it was my wife's idea, uh, because these, pu these books got published. Uh, it's a collection of books on their biographies, illustrated books, their biographies for children. Um, and the, the illustrator for those books is the same person that illustrated this cover here. Uh, and um, and so uh, we when we went uh, back to my home country last year, uh, we visited schools to promote the books and whatnot. And so my wife is like, you know, you should really have something other than the book to show the kids. So we contacted a doll maker, a professional doll, doll maker in Argentina, and sent her the illustrations from the books. Uh, and she created the dolls and shipped them over to us, and you know we're carrying them in this little suitcase. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a lot of fun too. Yeah. Uh, tell our audience a little more about uh, the children's books that you that you created. Yeah. So the children's books, um, it's a collection of six books. Uh, three of them were published last year. Three of them were published this year. Uh, about historical figures um, from from your wife's history. So it's very much geared toward uh, the local market there. Some of them are being used in schools by teachers. When I visited schools, they were telling me that they will read this to um, this. They're, they're first readers. So, you know, first, second, third grade, more or less. Um, and they're illustrated biographies uh, about these people um, that I find interesting. Uh, and of course, when you work with, um, with a big publisher, um, there, there's, the advantage of working with the big publishers is they have incredible distribution channels. Uh, um, but they also, of course, that means they require a lot in terms of, you know, we want to make sure that this is like this, and this is like that, and they have a very specific target in mind. So I, I, I'm very lucky because I get to work with a big publisher in my home country and see what that's like. And then I get to work with an independent publisher here um, in Texas and see what that's like. Um, and of course, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. I'm really interested. Who who else did you cover? So the other people I covered, um, I tried to get people that um, that represent different um, different walks of life. So she's a poet. So I covered her, and then I covered someone called Jose Artigas. He is your wife's version of uh, George Washington. So this is sort of like a national hero. Um, then I covered an, an, an educator, um, uh, Barelas is his last name, um, and that was the first three books. And then this book, I covered a painting, a painter, he's many things, but he's mostly known as a painter called Pedro Figari. Um, and then I also did um, a feminist, someone who fought for, uh, for the right of women to vote. Um, her name is Paulina Luisi. Uh, and then an actress, uh, her name is China Sorrisa. She died in, in 2014, in fact. Uh, so she's the more recent one. Um, so I tried to do different walks of life uh, because these are for children. So they're intended to inspire kids uh, to get them thinking, you know, this, I could be a writer or I could be, you know, an educator. I could be this and that. Well, I mean, since we have, you know, since we have time, <laughs> I'm actually interested in asking you about each one of these people. But um, before we do that, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in like um, hearing you expanding a little bit on what went into the selection process. Like why this person, why that person, why that, because you're, you're picking, you know, essentially, you know, these are the quintessential people of the nation that kids should learn about. So how did you go about making those decisions? Okay, so there were several factors. One of them is um, they had to be people that I was interested in, right? Uh, and so, so I made a preliminary list of people. Um, another factor for me was because, like I said, I wanted this to be helpful for children and for parents with their children. I have small children, so I'm thinking as a parent here. Uh, and uh, so I wanted them to be lives that I thought were somehow worthy of being known, right? Uh, that these people had done something with their lives that was interesting somehow. Um, and that... Um, that was helpful, you know, people, something that 
people who children could look up to. Uh, and and then I wanted them to have different, um, I didn't want to do like 10 national heroes, you know, or, you know, or 10 writers or, or 10 celebrities. I, I wanted them to really be different things. I also wanted this to appeal to both boys and girls. So I wanted it to be more or less the same amount. So first year we did two men and a woman. And this year we did two women and a man. Uh, and um, and the other thing was for me, they had to be dead. Uh, because I, I believe that um, people who are alive will disappoint you at some point in their lives. Uh, so I thought it's better if they're dead. Uh, and we sort of already know their whole life story. Uh, and, you know, can be disappointed in them later on, I guess. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird selection process. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. All right, well, let's go down the line. Tell us about Jose, the national hero. Okay, so he was, um, he was, uh, you know, he fought against the Spanish uh, for, for independence. But unlike, um, unlike Washington, he lost. Uh, and he was exiled and he lived the last 20 years of his life in exile. So actually the country's independence took place not under his guidance. So this makes him very interesting to me because he became a national hero through the power of his ideas, not through his military prowess. He was never the president. He never held any political uh, position in the new government. In fact, he never lived in Uruguay as an independent country. Um, so that to me makes him, that was my focus on, on the book that really what made him interesting was the power of his ideas uh, that people caught on to even when militarily he wasn't able to achieve what he wanted. All right. Um, that is interesting. I, I, I would be interested in talking more about that, but we have a long list here. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about uh, Borrios. Bor okay, so that's the educator, Varela, right? And yeah. uh, yes, so he was this, uh, he lived in the second half of the 19th century in a time where there wasn't really a system of public education uh, in, in, in my country of Uruguay. And he was part of a movement of people who thought we really need to set up this public education system. Uh, and he traveled to Europe. He wanted to be a poet. That was his thing. And he met Victor Hugo when he was in Europe. But then he traveled to the United States um, and he met some people and he became interested in education. And he saw how the educational system worked in the US. He brought a whole bunch of books uh, back home with him about education. Uh, and he spearheaded an educational revolution in essence. Um, and then, uh, which had, three basic parameters. Education had to be universal, it had to be free, and it had to be secular. Uh, and that's really, he's sort of the father of the national public educational system. Uh, so that was interesting to me. Did he did he face any like pushback from um, the Catholic Church uh, at the time? So, of yeah. the yes, he had, he had pushback, of course, from the traditionalist sectors. Uh, and, um, and he also had pushback, pushback from some of his early allies because at some point there was a, a coup d'etat there was a dictator and the dictator liked his ideas and so offered to make him minister of education and and he accepted uh and he died in the position three years later uh and so some of his friends were like why are you working with the dictator but he was practical he was like look this is the only way we can get this done uh and so he set up a system that continued to be worked for really the next 20 or 30 years, but he set it up. So he did face pushback from different sectors in society. Um, but very, I mean, within a generation, people were thinking this guy is like a serious visionary and hero. Yeah. 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 Um, on to the painter. Okay. So the painter, um, he was this, uh, this, man early 19th century as well um, figari his name is pedro figari um and he came into painting actually once he retired so during his life he did all sorts of things um one of the things he he was uh, an educator um he was briefly a politician he was a lawyer um and one of his things when he was a lawyer is he he defended a man who had been wrongly accused of murder and got him acquitted so he became he was he became convinced that the death penalty was 
really messed up and made it sort of a lifelong quest to fight against the death penalty and was instrumental in getting rid of the death penalty in Uruguay. Um, and then he went into art education because at heart he was an artist. So he was a lawyer to make ends meet, but he was an artist at heart. And then he was given a job um, in a vocational school and he wanted to, you know, okay, if you're going to be a carpenter, that's fine, but you need to know how to make your carpentry beautiful and whatnot. Uh, and then he retired and he gave himself fully to painting. Uh, and he became a renowned artist. He he had exhibits uh, in, in, in Argentina, really that's where he launched his career, but then in Europe and whatnot. Um, and so that's sort of him in a nutshell. All right. Tell us about, um, I mean, these are all fascinating. So, I mean, we could, we could, I'm sure, talk for hours upon each one of these uh, individuals, but, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to get, the, we're trying to pack a lot of the time we have together. Tell us about uh, Paulina, the, the suffragette. Right. So, um, Paulina Luisi is a very interesting person because she, uh, her mother was a French suffragette and her father was an Italian radical. He fought with Garibaldi uh, in Italy for, for unification of Italy. And then um, she was born in Argentina. And then when she was, I think, three, they moved to Uruguay. And her parents had a lot of daughters. I can't remember exactly how many. I think it was like eight or nine. And uh, they, they pushed education really hard on all of them. Um, one of her sisters became a renowned uh, poet. Another one of her sisters became a lawyer. Um, the, the family moved to the capital city so that she could pursue her, her education. She became, first she became a teacher, which is what women did back then. This is the early 20th century. Um, but then she went to med school and it wasn't against the law. It was just that no woman had ever done it. Um, and so she got a lot of pushback from society. There's a picture of her and, and her classmates and it's like, she's the one woman surrounded by a sea of men uh and and she got pushed back even from her from her classmates and whatnot so she became the first medical doctor the first female medical doctor in uruguay um and she became a, a she did very well for herself because she became an OBGYN. so you know she got all the women would go to her and she became a um also uh, she worked with children so she was a pediatrician um but there was always this sort of fire burning inside her. She was really bothered about how many political rights women didn't have. So she organized women and she had her network extended into Argentina and into Europe. Uh, she gave talks in Scandinavia and she was involved in, um, in also in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and she was very much one of her big things was, of course, women's suffers that women could vote um so she was instrumental in getting women to receive the right to vote in uruguay so she was out there giving talks and loving the legislators and gathering signatures out in the in the street and whatnot um so she's interesting as well and she's one of the people um in these books yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm 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 reading i'm reading here that she was also very passionate about poetry yes indeed um she, she came from a family where they were all into all sorts of things, and yes, a lot of these people, in fact, were interestingly enough. Um, uh, tell us about the actress. Okay, so her name, her actually, her full name is like super long. It's got like seven or eight names, but uh, her her stage name, people know her as China Sorrisa, um, and she comes from one of these patrician families. Uh, her grandfather was a renowned poet. He was the poet laureate or the equivalent of the poet laureate of Uruguay in the early 20th century. And her grandfather was instrumental in creating a sense of, of nationality and nationhood through poetry. So a lot of his poems were about sort of the, the epic creation of the nation and they were read in schools and in public events. And, um, and then her father was you walk around the capital city and you see his sculptures all over the place. And they were also about sort of the, the gaucho as this sort of majestic cowboy-like um, heritage. Uh, and, and so she was raised in this home of artists and, and she loved acting. That was her thing. Um, she came from a very Catholic home. So her first 
She went to a Catholic school. Her first acting was in a play about the Virgin Mary. Um, and then she wanted to act. Now, it wasn't considered back in, you know, back in the 30s and 40s, this wasn't seen as sort of like a good career path for a woman. Um, but she wanted to act. And, uh, you know, at some point the, after World War II, the British Council gave a scholarship to take someone to learn acting uh, in Britain. She applied for the scholarship. She got it. She claimed that she spoke English and she didn't. Uh, she didn't have money to get over there to Britain. So she she managed to get passage on a cargo ship. Uh, and so she went on this cargo ship to post-war Britain and it was, you know, the city was crumbled and, and it was raining all the time. And so she was there for a while. As a small child, uh, she had lived in France uh, when her father was working on a, on a statue. Um, and then she came back home and she continued acting and she became a very famous stage actress. Uh, and then at some point she moved to Argentina uh, and in Argentina, she, at the time, this is the 60s and 70s, Argentina was the big TV and movie hub of the region. Uh, so she started doing TV and movies and theater in Argentina, and she basically continued doing that until, you know, late into her life. Um, and, and she, she was really people who knew her, loved her because of, she was very charismatic and, you know, very tender and, and the way she dealt with people and whatnot. So do you, do you have um did, did you create dolls for each one of them? The 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 dolls no just for the first three because the other three got published uh, in March and then the pandemic hit and our flights got we were gonna fly to Uruguay and uh, and our flights got canceled <laughs> so we've commissioned the next three but we haven't seen them so I have dolls for the first three so I, I showed you this one right um, so that's uh, Juana de Barburu our poet uh, and this is uh, this is Jose Artigas so this is the, <laughs> the national hero who didn't win in battle uh, but his ideas caught on anyway uh, and then um, this is the reformer right here uh, <laughs> so he's got this because he's got this little fake beard right uh, because it's kind of childish and playful right uh, he had in real life he had a huge beard and so the illustrator played with this and thought what if it was a fake beard you know and so she made it a little fake beard and then the doll maker made it a fake beard too that's funny that's great um what have children's responses been to the books uh as well as the dolls when, when you go present so uh so kids love the books uh it's it's so really, I mean, it sounds trite, but it, it makes you feel so sort of good uh, or humble or small, whatever you want to say. When you go to school and you talk to these kids and these kids have read your book and they're interested and, you know, some of them will tell you something like, hey, I can draw too. Or, you know, um, I, I remember I was with this. This was a very tender moment for me. It was a, a school for the deaf. And uh, so the girl was talking to me. Uh, through an interpreter. So she was signing and I couldn't understand what she was saying. But the interpreter was telling me that um, the girl too wrote poetry uh, and she was inspired by my book about uh, Juana de Ibarburu to continue to write poetry. Uh, so that was very touching for me, right? Um, and, uh, and and of course they love the dolls, right? They all went and grabbed the dolls and we have to be a little bit careful because they're fragile. They're not very, I mean, they're they're to see and not to play with, but you know, so they'll they'll come up to them and they want to take a picture with a doll and whatnot. That's fantastic. That's a beautiful story. Um, so yeah, let, let's 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 get back to the book. This is your first book of published poetry, right? Yes, indeed. So first uh, first book I would had poetry published before uh, in the Boundless anthologies uh, and uh, La Bloga, which is a, a poetry website. Uh, had published something, and so I'd had, um, you know, po po poetry published uh, in, in local outlets mostly, um, and this is really my first uh, poetry book. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited and happy uh, for the support too. Uh, I'm working on getting uh, M. Sedano on here, so can you tell our audience a little bit about Lobloga? Okay, right. So La Bloga is a poetry blog uh, 
from from the region that um, that publishes. You know, so some of these poets we've talked about, you'll find them on there as well. Uh, and so occasionally they'll have like a call for um, a floricanto or a, a thematic set of poems. Uh, and so they they and they publish in English, of course, but they'll also do things uh, in Spanish or bilingually as well. So my poem that they published um, was uh, a, a, a love poem because it was a Valentine's themed uh, call um, in Spanish. You mentioned earlier um, being really encouraged by by Daniel to to produce this book and to you know to just finally pull her into it. Can you tell us a little bit about the the poetry scene there in San Gabriel? I mean, in San Gabriel in a, in the um, in the Rio Grande Valley and the different um, you know and, and just what it looks like and who are some of the key players and and, and what's uh, you know because always like. So it was like groups of people kind of moving together and, and encouraging each other and they enrich each other's work. So can you tell us a little bit about the writers there in the uh, in the Rio Grande Valley? So it surprised me when I came here. Uh, and it surprised me simply because I had no expectation one way or another. I didn't know much about the valley when I came. Uh, so one of the happy things for me was to see that it's really just teeming with literary life. Um, and... I, I remember a professor said something to me about to the effect of, uh, you know, I can, you know, turn a, any stone over and I'll get a writer, you know, here in the valley, um, because there really is uh, a lot of people doing this sort of thing, um, and so you get a lot of poets. So the poetry scene is very active. Um, for instance, in Brownsville, uh, once a month, there's uh, Spanish-speaking poets that get together at a a uh, place called Hueso del Fraile, uh, and they do uh, a quasi open mic. I mean, you have to sort of get on the list ahead of time. But, uh, and so they read their poems, and so you get um, a small community that does a lot of stuff in Spanish. Uh, then you get a much bigger community that's mostly based out of the McAllen, Edinburgh area, uh, but it really is all over the valley um, with poets, a lot of poets. Uh, so, of course, Daniel Garcia Ordaz is a big. Uh, player, he's been big in encouraging this through um, through the the festival. Um, but also, he's 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 pushed uh, writers to get together in writing groups, for instance, in different places. In Harlingen, there's a writing group. Uh, there's, of course, in in McAllen and on the island, there used to be one. I don't think it's active anymore. But um, but uh, so he's he's. He's big about getting writers to support each other. And if you haven't read his stuff, you need to. It's also very musical and very playful. Uh, and um, and then um, I mentioned uh, uh, Brenda Nero Riojas. She, um, she's also one of the founders of the festival. And she's done, if you haven't seen it, if you go online and you look for Corazón Bilingüe, it's a set of interviews that she did over several years to different writers in the valley, um, so you'll you if you go on there, you'll see people writing all sorts of different things, not just poetry. Uh, so she's sort of promoted literature uh, in this regard. And then uh, we've talked about uh, La Bloga. You have um, let me see. I'm trying to think. Okay, you in the past few years, there was also a Spanish language. Uh, so with the Rio Grande International. Valley Poetry Festival, that's any language really, um, but mostly English with some Spanish. And, but there was a Spanish language uh, um, festival also, uh, Festival Festival Internacional, uh, no, Festival Latinoamericano Internacional de Poesía, uh, FEIPOL is what it is for short, um, organized by Rosy Lima. So, um, so she's also. Uh, has published some poetry and things uh, and um, so you get a lot of people really doing this uh, over here uh, working on this um, and also you know people publish uh, a lot of self poet uh, published novels um, short stories uh, and, and so forth so there's a lot going on here it's, it's a good place to be a writer and to get a sense of community I definitely get I definitely get the sense of that. Can you tell us a little bit about uh um oh Daniel here 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 comes Daniel. 
All right, Daniel Garcia Ordaz says, uh, Brandon Rojas uh, Corazon Bilingual is excellent. Yes, agree? I, I agree. Yes, I've, I've heard, I can't say I've heard every interview on there, but I've heard a lot of them, for, uh, close to everyone. Uh, and yeah, I mean, his, her, you really should listen to it. Her interviews are great, uh, and her interviewees are all interesting. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, uh, again? So I mean, we've covered it a little bit, but can you, can you can you tell us a little bit again about um, about Edward and his role in Flower Songs and how uh, what what, uh, what what he's doing out there? Yeah. So so yeah. of course he's a big mover and shaker, right? Uh, and um, he's, he's his big project right now is uh, Flower Song Press. If you haven't had him on, I'm sure you'll have him at some point. Uh, and and he's of course the one that could tell you more about his vision and whatnot. The thing that impresses me about the work he does is that, um, first of all, this is a lot of hard work. I mean, getting one book published is a lot of work for the author, but it's a lot of work for the editor as well. And he does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of reading the manuscripts, in terms of editing them. Um, I know he works with uh, someone that helps with the layout, um, I think he told me the fact that this person is in Australia. Uh, and uh, and so that's a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of work. And I mean, he has a family, he has a full-time job like all of us. And he's he's really pulling together all these voices um, and providing them a platform that they otherwise wouldn't have um, to speak to the rest of America, right? And to say, um, you know, hey, listen, this is what, what this is our now, this is what we're saying, and uh, this is how we experience life, and and these are the beautiful things that we're creating. Um, and the press really is looking to do that originally through poetry, but now through a number of uh, of other genres as well. So, can you share with us another poem from your book? Um, yes, let me do that. And in fact, if if I'm not too pushy, at some point I'd like to. I have a bilingual poem uh that it hasn't been published uh but you know at some point i'd like to read that um i can read that now or i can read something else from the book or whatever you prefer uh why don't you read that one now and then we'll, we'll, we'll towards the end we'll get back to the poem from your book and then we'll okay um, and then we'll, okay. we'll you know where to find it great so uh let me get let me open uh this this other bilingual poem. So one of the beautiful things about living in uh, in the Rio Grande Valley is that you you discover that there's such rich history in this place. I mean, this place is key not only because, in essence, it triggered the Mexican-American War, um, but it's crucial to um, the Civil War as well. And there's just so much that has been going on here uh, through its history. Um, and so I've enjoyed reading about the history of the place and finding out about different things. So as I was reading about the Mexican-American War, one of the things that struck me was that this was really a shameful war for, for both the U.S. because it basically beat up the smallest kid in the playground, um, but also for Mexico because it handled it very poorly uh, um, in, in every aspect uh, that you can imagine. So let me. So I wrote a poem about this, and I thought this poem really needs to be um, bilingual, because in in some way the two languages reflect the two cultures and the opposing sides. So there's like two voices in the poem. Uh, one of them is in Spanish, and one of them is in English. Um, and the poem is called "Derrota Gloriosa, Shameful Victory," um, and and it's. It's hopefully not too long, but um, so here it goes. El problema de Texas. Aquel yermo desolado lo habitan indios salvajes y unos gringos traicioneros debemos asegurar. Es menester asentar y asimismo comerciar. Movamos también la tropa. Grandes, tan grandes los retos. Stephen Austin's Colony. In this enchanted country, on the, on the banks of the Brazos, we built our wooden houses and established our farms. We have brought agriculture and our slaves and our slaves do till the earth. We have brought prosperity and our ships do northward trade. El general Antonio López de Santa Ana. Al mando de esta campaña va Bizarro el general. Las bocas de sus cañones en la causa triunfarán y la honra de su victoria de gloria nos vestirá. En manos del general nuestra tropa vencerá. The Texas Revolution. The Tejanos, we will show that our fate is in our hands. 
the Mexicans, we will show that our cannons cannot be beat. From Washington and the Brazos to the Alamo and Goliad, we the civilized against the barbarians will prevail. Delirios de Reconquista. ¿Hay ya posibilidad de recobrar lo perdido? ¿Puede acaso el general que celebró las exequias de su tristísima pierna cumplir su áurea promesa? Reconquista y democracia, esperanzas de estos días. The Reluctant Republic. With our petition for annexation, we have convulsed the North. Why the rebuff and denunciation? Can they not see us for the taking? Will they not come and properly bind us at the Rio Grande? Let their swords cut swiftly, cut deep into the Sierra Madre. La crisis de la anexión. En el norte mora un cíclope con hambre de nuestras tierras. Vienen los músculos férreos y su boca es un abismo. Roguemos socorra a Europa, que el, ante, que el ente no nos devore. Olvidémonos de Texas, que el ente no nos devore. Republic no more. We the people are now ready to be persuaded to take Texas. Perhaps it was always ours, and our dominion we must secure. Let the Republic of Texas be no more. Let our border be the, the Rio Grande. Let us justly punish the Mexicans whole. For the halls of the Montezumas we go. Guerra. Comienza la intervención. Santa Ana intenta y no puede, huye en la noche la tropa, se desmorona la patria, hay disturbios en las calles, se desangra Yucatán, lleva, una, lleva a un estridente caos la derrota ignominiosa. War. Bow before our cranky artillery, bow at Palo Alto, resaca de la palma, Matamoros en Cerro Gordo. Make way for our troops, make way in Veracruz and Puebla. Watch our banner over Mexico City, give us the land we deserve, that we might bask in this glorious victory. Ay, como duele en el alma, por los siglos de los siglos, la derrota gloriosa. Oh, how quickly we move on and cast into oblivion this shameful victory. All right, so that's the point. That's very, uh, it's very much a, um, it's very much a, a, a bilingual poem as you, you described. I'm curious, um, I'm curious to hear when are you going to write in Spanglish like the rest of us? I'm, I'm, I'm actually very conscious about uh, cr doing creative writing uh, in English. This poem that I just read is the first time I tried that um, because my my native language, my A language, is Spanish. Uh, sort of my literary tradition was forged in Spanish, if you will. Uh, and so I do I do my academic writing in English. I publish all these articles and things in English, but that's sort of very dry and technical. And um, so, you know, I, I, I feel very self-conscious about doing that. And, and it's it sort of sits in the back of my mind that I could try this sort of thing with, that I did with this poem uh, some more. But um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a daring step for me. Yeah. Well, baby steps, but I'm very interested because I'm very interested in your take on, on what is called, what is referred to as Spanglish, where people slip in and out of English and Spanish, because you had this definitely in block segments, like this is the English side, this is the English speaking side, the Spanish speaking side, the English speaking side, the Spanish speaking side. Um, but like the, the poets that you see in the Rio Grande Valley, you see in California, you see all over, all over the Southwest, people just kind of like slipping in and out of Spanish, slipping in and out of English. What, what, what is your take on that as a native Spanish speaker, as well as somebody who, um, you know, also writes, who writes in both Spanish and English? Right. So... Um, this, you know, Spanglish, as, as it's called, and some people have an issue with that name. I don't. I mean, you've got to call it something, right? Uh, and uh, and, um, so, and and to me, Spanglish makes sense because it has Spanish and English, right? Uh, so, um, is I mean, it's not like random. Uh, there's very specific uh, rules in terms of how the grammar is set up and, and where you can switch and where you can do the breaks. And and, and um, so scholars, I, I haven't done this myself, but I've, I've seen some of these articles, um, write about this because it has people who say, well, that's not a language. Well, actually, it has its own set of rules. What it isn't, it isn't standardized. So there isn't like a grammar book or there isn't like a, a dictionary that says you can say this and you can't say the other. But it is, it does have very strict rules that people learn as they speak. So I didn't have this in my um, in my poem because in my poem, I wanted the two distinct voices, one of them representing the Mexican viewpoint and the other one representing the, the Anglo-American viewpoint. Um, so it didn't make sense to me to create the Spanglish there. Um, 
But I think so in terms of um, of so I see Daniel says uh, you know we call it text mix, um, and so uh, in in terms of you know of it being a valid mode of communication, of course it is. What happens is people who are monolingual speakers of Spanish, monolingual speakers of English, look at it with distrust uh, because they sort of understand it, but not fully. Uh, so I think to me, you have to know your audience. And this is what I tell my students. If you're writing for a specific audience, um, then you can use their language, or at least you can say, this is my language, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think if, if as a poet, if this is your language, this is how you communicate with others, then that's what you should do. Uh, if you're dominant in one language or the other, then that's what you should do as well. I think I think these are all valid, uh, sort of valid forms of culture, valid manifestations of the human experience. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I'm not, I'm not shaking here with saying I'm shaking my head at, at, the, at, the, at the, the, the provocations of one Daniel Garcia Ordaz. <laughs> talking about English is Tex-Mex. We call everything. You know, you know what we call Mexican food in California? We call it Mexican food because it's Mexican food. But anyways, um <laughs> but here's what here's what, what Daniel asks. Uh can your uh can you can you clarify the difference between code switching versus pochismo or Spanglish slash Tex Mex? Right. So um so uh you know, code switching uh is when what we're talking about in a way is when you switch between one language and the other um so if, let me give you an example and this i hadn't heard this before i came to the valley and this blew my mind it was one of the things that i talked to my wife when i went back the first time to her and i said look um you know people will be walking down the street and they'll say something like um you know i didn't want to go mi abuelita, pero siempre me habló, so I went anyway, right? And so this seamless in and out, uh, that's the code switching. Um, what happens, though, is that um, this, this is, it really is from a social, what people call social linguistics, so the study of social attitudes toward language. So in terms of social attitudes, that's where you get into the problem because people who speak this way grow up hearing that that's not the right way to talk. Um, so people here in the, in the border, when they go to visit their relatives in Mexico, they become very self-conscious of their Spanish because their relatives tell them, oh, your Spanish sucks. Uh, and then when they go somewhere else in the US, they become self-conscious of their code switching um, because people are like, you know, speak, speak American, right? Uh, and so, so this is really, not about the rules per se of communication, but about the attitudes that people have. So when I talk to my students here in the Valley, um, you know, and I tell them, so what do you think of Valley Spanish? Um, and, you know, so they go, ah, it's Spanish Pocho, you know. Hmm. Uh, and so then we, we need to discuss, well, why is this? Why do you feel this way? Um, you know, who makes the decisions as to what, is and isn't proper of course that's the community but then you need to think about also at what levels these decisions get made right um so these are all sort of things to think about um and and to have i think good fruitful discussions about yes yes i i, I agree we should have great fruitful discussions despite the outrageous provocations of one daniel garcia or does <laughs> <laughs> claiming english is a as a as a as a uh, peculiar Texas phenomenon. Anyhow, um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, can you share another poem from uh, from uh, from your your wonderful collection? Yes, thank you, thank you for that opportunity. Um, let me share. Um, all right. So this was most of these poems are kind of upbeat, but this one uh, maybe isn't. I don't know. <laughs> called um, A veces en la soledad de la noche. A veces en la soledad de la noche, cuando la oscuridad pesa sobre mi cuerpo acostado, siento que soy un embrión de barro inerte con el sino de mucho más. Y deseo tomarme de un solo trago todos los unos y ceros del planeta. Deseo sentir lo que siente el cóndor cuando se cuelga ufano por encima de la cordillera. Deseo flotar en un cauce de polvo cósmico hasta el sol y ensordecer con el estruendo de dos átomos cuando hacen un fotón. 
deseo traspasar los límites del sistema solar en el fulgor cegador de la cola de un cometa. Deseo pararme en el filo de un horizonte de sucesos para embriagarme con la entropía interior del agujero negro más negro. Deseo ver los colores de los rayos que me atraviesan, el zafiro de los gamas, el esmeralda de los X, el rubí de los infrarrojos. Deseo sostener en cada mano un planeta y ser todos los átomos de una galaxia. Deseo correr el velo que cubre el universo y allí adivinar la morada de Dios. A veces, en la soledad de la noche, cuando la oscuridad pesa sobre mi cuerpo acostado, aborrezco mi lodo mal formado. All right. Stunning. All right, so where, tell, tell the audience where they can find your work and, uh, and how they can, uh, they can purchase your, your, your book um, um, and, uh, and have something to read during this uh, the shut-in. Great, thank you. Yes, so the book, uh, there's several outlets where you can find it uh, online. Of course, you can go to the Flowersome Press website. Uh, it's on there. Um, it's also on Amazon, uh, so that's the, a popular one. It's also on barnesandnoble.com. Uh, so unfortunately, Barnes and Noble will be closing a lot of its stores now because of the pandemic. Uh, but if you go onto the online uh, website that they have, you, you can find it on there as well. Um, and then on my blog, if if people write to me uh, or if they write to me on Facebook, then I have PayPal and can get it to people. But the, the big three, I guess I would say, are you know, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and, um, and the Flowers on Press website. Fantastic. I want to thank you uh, so much, Gabriel, for having joined us this hour. Um, you know, anytime I saw me typing, I was researching things you were saying. I want you, you had my full attention this entire time. Um, Except for right now, because I was Googling to see if he put me on barnesandnoble.com too, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you so much uh, uh, giving us this hour of your time, and um, it was it was a, it was a great lesson uh, on on the history of Uruguay. I, I learned I learned a lot from this one. So um, thank you. But, no, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to talk, and you know, for giving us this platform to sort of get our our voices heard. And um, you know, you said I, I was. Uh, we were together at a, a festival um, here in the Rio Grande Valley earlier this year, um, and I saw you read, and that's why I tell people you have to hear him uh, because you have sort of this amazing energy, and, and I was really blown away by it. And there was something you said there that I think is crucial um, for, for people to understand generally, which is that we need to build the infrastructure because the big, the big, you know, now there's this whole, you know, um, with the American dirt controversy, and I don't want to get into it because then you give more fuel to the thing, but um, the big publishing houses aren't interested in the kind of stories we're telling and the kind of voices uh, we have. So it's this thing you're doing, this helps build the, interest, the infrastructure. Uh, yeah. And you know, and it helps people know uh, where to go and whatnot. Uh, so thank you so much um, for well, doing this. You know, I. I I don't have anyone come up right now, so we can extend this conversation a little bit. See, like if, if this was like the American dirt version of like asking you questions, I'd have been like, Ooh, tell us about the dictator. Did you have to hide in a tunnel? You know, that that's what they do to us, right? And that's what right. they're gonna get yes. to us, right? And so like they're gonna look for the most lurid details, they're gonna look for the most um, you know, you know, like th these details where it's like it sounds like they're being sympathetic to like uh, the hardships we may suffer, but it's really very fetishistic. Because you know, in the you know, in in the United States of America, it's not like, hey, I'm from L.A. Oh, you're from L.A. Tell us about the you know, like uh, the the ice raids and like, oh my God, like there's homeless people. You know, like the, you don't find the most lurid details of like um of of something from 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 a, a kind of like a dominant group of people, even though those those details exist. They exist in Los Angeles, just they exist in uh you know Uruguay or, or anywhere in the world, right? Uh, if you're looking for them, so. I think that like anytime they'll tell our stories, they're gonna look for, um, you know, the side of light that they that can be, they can, and even if you're gonna tell that that part of part of you know life and that and tell you know people like really struggling in the plight of uh, of people who just you know uh, for whatever reason find themselves in really dire straits in a very desperate situation, um, you you write about them as though they're not people, right? And that's what they're gonna continue to do to us. They're gonna write about us as though we're not people, as though we're just these 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 wild animals or something like that or or was always were these like uh not even wild animals because even that would be like even that's more like you know to look at it you know something in it in it and it's whatever they, they, they're going to keep debasing us um in order to like feel better about themselves and 
That's what's going to happen if we keep if we keep if we keep if we keep publishing with them. They're they're going to they're going to demand that we do that to ourselves. You know, that's the way in. I mean, do you not agree? And and I haven't you know I haven't read the book. Uh, I'm, it's just not interesting uh, to me. Uh, and so you know I, I can't speak to the content itself, but I do agree that there's you know it's a business model, right? And the, these big publishers and, and like I said, I, I work with a big publisher in, in my in my home country, and they're very good at promoting their books and things. So that's sort of what you lose when you're not publishing with them. You lose these amazing channels of distribution. Um, but these kind of this conversation that we had, you wouldn't have through these big uh, channels of distribution. So I agree with you that you have to create the alternative channels of distribution, and we have to find ways for people to know that this is happening, right? Because if they don't know, they can't look for it. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would be interested and who would read these kind of things, you know, who, who would read Flowers on Press, but they don't know about it because they live, you know, somewhere in Wyoming. And uh, and so, and, and the infrastructure for us right now is very small, it's very tenuous. Uh, so we, of course, need to support each other uh, and get the word out and get this Mm -hmm. so that it can reach other places and other people that it normally wouldn't yes so we need to build up the press and we also need to build a network of presses i mean the presses need to be networked in a way in which it's not like it's not like it's not like this monopoly capital game it's not like we're trying to like eat everyone else up it's it's like we need to connect one to the next to the next to the next so that it becomes like like voltron like like a, it becomes like a, a machine that that comes together um and can and can you know, get people across. I mean, get, get individual writers across the country and get um, presses into different cities. I mean, like, you know, what I'm saying like like um, like uh, something like uh, Nomadic Press, for instance. Right. Nomadic Press publishes in Oakland um, and they also and, and in Bay Area generally, they're also in New York. Right. But like maybe there's a way that Flower Songs can help Nomadic Press get into like Texas and into, into different parts of that. Maybe there's a way that um, Nomad Press can help Flower Song, you know, like expand into the Bay. Maybe there's a way, I mean, there's ways that just the different people have different areas and, you know, like Edward as, as you know, Edward works really, really hard, but he can't publish everybody, right? So like maybe there's a way to get like certain manuscripts at different places um, and it could help, you know, it could help expand the reach of different places. I mean, I'm not sure that uh, uh, any different press is, is interested in, in particular areas, but I'm, what I'm saying is just that like, you know, we need to start creating these highways. Right. You know? Yes. Yes. I, I, I agree. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. This, this Brownsville poem, right. Uh, about the future and the dreaming of these two girls, which is the two cultures. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about what lies ahead. And of course there's always pushback, but, uh, but that's, that's life, right. Everything that's worth seeing, for instance, this takes a lot of hard work. Uh, and so I'm optimistic about those possibilities. And of course, the first step is getting people who are involved in this um, to realize that, to have that vision. I And I mentioned it because I hadn't thought of it until you said it. And then I was like, oh my goodness, he's right. I mean, it, it sort of made a lot of pieces fall together in my mind. So yeah, so congrats and uh, you know, keep up the good work. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Gabriel. This has been a, this has been a pleasure uh, talking to you for this hour plus. Um, Again, let, let, let's close out telling them where can they find your book um, one more time and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, yeah. Let, 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 let. Um, I see that Daniel here has uh, asked uh, where my, um, where my blog is and I, I can't type onto there, but uh, it's, uh, I'm just looking up here. It's, it's my phone name, Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez dot WordPress dot com. Uh, and so that's the blog, and I have several um, several tabs on there. One of them is poetry, and you'll find this on there. Uh, and and one of the things I mentioned on there is that, in fact, you can find the book at the Flower Song Press website, uh, barnesandnoble.com, and at amazon.com, uh, or you can message me as well. So thank you for, for your time, and I hope that maybe somebody will be interested in reading it and uh, find it enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have a good one. You too.